Um, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thanks for uh, joining us for the last uh, ISRF panel of the year. So with this, we will close and we will uh, then uh, resume the, the series uh, with the next academic year. Um, so we have a great uh, panel today with, on a very interesting topic, um, semiotics and information systems. We have uh, uh, with us, uh, so of course, the, both the authors of the paper that we are going to discuss. So today also we, we are experimenting with this slightly different style of panel where we have uh, we have, we have the discussion centered on a, on, a, on a paper, but it's just of course uh, as a as a way to have a sort of a common departure point. And uh, of course, it's always informal and free to to depart and go anywhere. Um, so. Uh, uh, John Mingers and uh, Leslie Wilcox. Uh, they, of course, they are both known for not only semiotics but also critical realism and many other things. Um, and uh, as I'm going to give very informal in introductions because uh, uh, um, most of the people or everybody knows uh, the panelists here. And of course, Ronald Stamper, who has been uh, uh, here at the LSE, basically starting the information systems department from. The, since the late 60s, huh? Yeah, long time ago. Yes, and then Classic pioneering. 68. Yeah. When, when the student troubles were around. <laughs> when, when I started my job here, I was told to push off for six weeks. <laughs> so I took my family by motor caravan all over Spain until things had quietened down. That came back. So it was a nice way of starting a job. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, you, it was very, very useful to be a semiotician because you you could have for people to make sense of what was happening. Oh, yes, right? yes. Um, and, um, and so and then we should be joined also by Professor Kichang Liu, who's also been uh, writing extensively books and papers on uh, semiotics and information systems. So we've got uh, four experts on the topic. We can't fail today. Uh, and with this, uh, I leave the um, um, word to Leslie, who is going to start uh, introducing the paper. No? Okay. I'll be your remote control. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd be nice to see you all. Uh, yeah, a world replete with semiotics. Um, I'll give a very brief introduction to the genesis of the paper, and then we'll, we'll be back 30 minutes, and then uh, Bob will, will, will take over. The slides aren't very good on, on this reproduction here, so we, we probably have to be quite explicit. Um, the world replete with semiotics. Two points of departure recently for me. One was um, I was driving down the M4 recently, motorway, and I had a double take at something, and it was uh, in the middle part of the uh, motorway, there was a thing, an object, and it said on it, this is not a sign. And discuss, when is a sign not a sign? <laughs> And um, the second point of departure was I ordered uh, 60 books recently uh, from Paul Gray Macmillan, uh, and they failed to arrive. And I rang them up, and they, they kept going through a system that said, we've rescheduled your books to another date. And I said, well, this is, I have not rescheduled these books. Why haven't they arrived? I need them for today. And uh, it turned out that the reason that they had not arrived is because the, the lorry drivers only took note of the postcode. And the postcode was incorrect because it was, I wrote it as WC1E to AE, not WC2. And I said, well, you know, this is the London School of Economics. It's the Department of Management. It's got my name. It's got all the contextual data you need. And they said, well, they only take notice of the postcode. So are we moving now to a world where we ignore context, we ignore all the other signs, all the evidence, but we're focusing on one sign and accepting that is the only true version of, of reality. Which is why we, we're, to some extent, why we looked at this paper. There is another Genesis story here, which is John and I have always enjoyed working together, but alas, it's been all too intermittent for various reasons. And uh, originally we were going to work on a paper on pragmatism. And, and John said, well, actually much more interesting is Percy's version of uh, semiotics embedded in pragmatism and it was particularly pertinent because we wanted to get into an edition of uh, MIS quarterly, our top 
journal that was uh, on socio-materiality, but we wanted to critique socio-materiality from a semiotics perspective. That was the, uh, the genesis of the paper. And, um, and in the end, it was rejected from the special issue because it was too critical of socio-materiality. And we couldn't abide the changes that they asked us to make to a more routine very issue of MIS Q, and we, we ended up doing what we think is a better paper uh, for information and organisation. So if we look at the next slide, is that the, our agenda is, uh, John is going to take us through most of this because he's much better at presenting um, uh, in, in, in easy to speak English uh, on the, the first uh, five issues and um, presenting the inter integrative semiotic framework. And then I'll, I'll wash up at the end uh, with some illustrative examples and some critique of socio-materiality. Um, I'm assuming here that they know what socio-materiality is, but John, you will tell them if, if, if they don't. Off you go. Okay, thank you. Um, the postcode thing is quite interesting because recently I tried to go somewhere on my sat nav and I put the postcode in, and usually it's quite good at finding the postcodes, and uh, the place where I was going was quite close to the M1. And as we were proceeding up the M1, the Saturn there suddenly declared, you have reached your destination right in the middle of the M1. And it wasn't there at all, of course, because it happened that this postcode actually included the M1 as part of its area. Uh, so indeed, you can't trust postcodes. Um, OK, as Leslie said, uh, I, I think I need to speak fairly quickly through this, but by all means, stop me if you feel that you need to at any point. I'm quite happy do that. Um, we started out with this idea of uh, looking at socio-materiality. Um, I'm not quite sure how much anybody will know, so I'll just say a little bit about it. Uh, but it seems to us, or to me, that two of the most basic things about being a human being are A, the ability to coordinate our actions together through language, that is what originally led human beings to develop language, and secondly, the ability to shape our environment through tools. Uh, and which is usually generally material kind of thing. So those two domains, the social and material, the communication and the material, are I think at the very basis of uh, what it means to be a human being. Um, and so that leads obviously to the question, what is the relationship between those two domains? In what way are those domains different? Uh, and what is the relationship between them? Uh, and I think there's, in, in the history of the literature, there's three sort of answers to that question. Um, one sees one system as being dominant over the other, um, and on one hand it could be those who tend to see technology as dominant, uh, and that technology is shaping the way that our human society works. And I have to say that given the changes that have occurred to, to society and to communications over the last 10 to 15 years, driven essentially by technological changes, one can see some sense in that. Um, at the other end of the extreme are the people who say, no, uh, technology exists, but it is essentially always shaped by, so, by the social. Uh, so it is the social system which dominates technology. Um, the second approach is to see them as two interacting systems, two separate but systems which in some way have their own development, but mutually shape each other as separate uh, but existing systems. And a good example of that, uh, going way back to the 50s, is what's called socio-technical systems. Some of the very original studies which I still think are excellent on looking at mining and things like that, Tristan Bancroft and so on, um, where they saw it as a combined social and technical system uh, interlinked in many ways. Uh, and that's probably where I would come from in general, seeing it as two interacting systems. But then in recent times, a third approach has developed, uh, and this is what became known as socio-materiality. And the basic idea is that the two um, are so mutually shaping, so mutually interacting, that it is literally impossible to pull them apart, that one cannot really define one without defining the other. Uh, and that's really what socio-materiality is about. And I think it's, at least in, in the way that it was expressed by people like uh, Rondo Lukowski, if you take it seriously, then it is a very radical viewpoint. And um, if you could go on to the next slide, just to illustrate some of the things that were said, uh, if you haven't seen this stuff, um, it was developed, the ideas originally come actually from a philosopher of science called Karen Barron, who was a philosopher of, of hard physical science, in fact she's interested in quantum theory and such like. 
So where she was coming from was looking at the really weird things that go on in quantum theory. Uh, but this, these ideas she had were picked up, particularly by Lewandowski, and then applied at the social level. And as I say, here's some quotes. So from Barrow, agencies of observation signals the inseparability of the material and semiotic apparatuses. The material and semiotic apparatuses form a non-dualistic whole. So her viewpoint is that one cannot in any way separate material physical things from the ways that we actually observe and interact with them. Uh, on my agential realist elaboration, phenomena do not merely mark the epistemological inseparability of observe and observe, rather phenomena are the ontological inseparability of agentially interacting components. So she's saying very strongly we can't pull these things apart at all. And uh, Orykowski took that up, there is no social that is not material and no material that is not social. And more, even more explicitly, in other words, entities, whether human or technologies, have no inherent properties, but acquire all attributes and capabilities through their interpenetration. Um, now, I think that's very extreme, and it's something that I don't really accept very much at all. The idea that you cannot separate these things whatsoever, or even say they have properties <coughs> in their own, it seems to me pushing things rather too far. Um, so that's really where we were coming from, wanting to bring an alternative perspective on that. Um, what we then did, really, was to develop a framework, starting out uh, at the lowest level, if you like, uh, of our semiotic interactions with each other, and then building up through other levels of information, of embodiment, and finally to the sort of social world itself. So we built up the framework in a series of layers. Um, okay, next slide. So the, the, we start um, with an underlying philosophy uh, that we need to handle this sort of thing because we do have to accept, or I would put forward the idea that the social and material are intrinsically different from each other and therefore we need a philosophy which is able to handle both of those different uh, ways of coming to know. Uh, so we're dealing with distinct ontological domains, the social, cognitive and the material. And that is something that critical realism, the philosophical perspective that I go on with, is quite happy with. It accepts a plurality of different ontologies, a plurality of different types of entities, types of things that have different sorts of properties, and that thereby require different sorts of means of access to them. If they have different sorts of properties, we may well need to access them epistemologically in different ways. Uh, and, as I say, that's very much what critical realism is happy with. Uh, not going to go into critical realism very much, except to highlight these as four of the primary distinctions that critical realism makes, or four of the primary sort of tenets. Firstly, when it talks about science, it's a philosophy of science, and it draws the distinction between what it calls the intransitive and the transitive domains of science. Now, the transitive domains of science are the things that we human beings do, what we're doing at this moment. They are the journal papers we write, the experiments we do, everything that is humanly produced to do with science, and therefore depends upon us and what we do. But it insists very strongly that different from that and separately from that, separate from that, is an <coughs> intransitive domain of objects of knowledge. Uh, they may be physical, they may be conceptual, they may be of many different types, but they are at some level separate from the knowledge that we gain off. And in principle, knowledge must be knowledge of something. So the intransitive domain is the domain of mechanisms and objects and structures which we try to gain knowledge of. Uh, there's a distinction drawn between the real, which is the whole thing, everything, but in principle it consists of uh, generative mechanisms. It consists of structures, mechanisms, as I say, physical, social, mental, cognitive, that interact with each other. And through their interactions, they generate the domain of events, things that actually occur. Again, like what is occurring now, this is, this is an actuality, this is an event that is happening over a point of time, generated by many different sorts of generative mechanisms which have led to us all being here. Um, so there's the real, and there's the actual, and a small subset of the actual domain of events is what we call the empirical, the ones that we actually observe and measure and make a note of and try to explain. Uh, and that's important because if we think about the main philosophy of science empiricism, what it essentially means is that it is restricting itself simply to that small domain of empirical events. It is not able to go beneath the surface of 
to look at the domain of the actual and the domain of the real. Um, thirdly, in terms of causality, again, one of the primary features of positivism anyway, is the idea of uh, human causality. That all we can mean by causality is a succession of events. A happens, then B follows. We cannot, again, go beneath the surface to try and explain why that happens. Uh, in critical realism, we have generative causality, the idea that these mechanisms <coughs> in their interactions generate events. Uh, and all of that means that we can accept epistemic relativity. That is, we have to accept that we do not have access directly to the world, that our epistemic knowledge of it is always conditioned socially and historically. But that does not mean to say that we therefore have to have judgmental relativity. We still are able to judge and choose between competing theories. We don't have to accept that everybody's view is as good as anybody else's. Um, okay, so that's the sort of framework one critical realism. Then we move up a level into the idea of semiotics. Uh, and in essence, semiotics is the study of signs, where a sign is any event, object, symbol, or behavior that represents something other than itself. So this, that's really all there is about a sign. It is something that represents something other than itself. But of course, to be a sign, signs depend upon shared sets of meanings. Signs don't just come to be by themselves, they uh, become developed and enacted through uh, shared sets of meanings within particular communities. Uh, and it is only through that social element that signs come to have the meaning they have. Um, semiotics is the study of the processes that leads to and generates those signs and the ways in which they come to have the meanings they have and the effects and the communications which they have. So in many ways, given that all of our interactions are about meaning and all of our interactions are therefore about semiotics, semiotics in many ways is the most fundamental of all the social sciences because nothing much happens by way of interaction without it happening in a semiological way. Um, there's two primary sort of intellectual sources for semiotics. Uh, one is Ferdinand de Saussure, who was a linguist and really only talked about linguistic systems. And he uh, created the essential concepts, constructs of the signifier and the signifier. So the signifier is the sign, the signifier is the meaning that the sign has. Um, obviously, I'm simplifying the here. Uh, Keep going. <laughs> um, Perth, uh, spelled Piers, but pronounced Perth, um, brought a third thing into it, which is one of the reasons why I think we like him more. Uh, which is he saw that semiotics involved a triadic relationship between the signifier that he called the representatum, the signified, its meaning, which he called the interpretant, and he also brought in the idea of the referent, the object that the sign referred to as a separate domain to its meaning. And therefore that makes uh, Peirce a much more of a realist person, not a naive realist, but at least bringing in, as Pascal does, the domain of the intransitive objects. Um, this is a little diagram, typical diagram of what Percy's uh, sign was about. I'm not going to go into it in great detail, but we've got the representation at the top, which is the sign or the sign vehicle, as he sometimes said. Um, and he distinguished, he made many distinctions, but the primary distinction in terms of signs was between icons, indexes, and symbols. Icons, and it's about the way in which the sign has a re relationship to what it represents. So icons uh, are related to what they represent by some degree of similarity. They look a bit like them, they sound like them, they feel like them, they are. Indexes are related to their objects by causality. There must be some causal relationship leading the index to have the value it does. So uh, a clock is uh, an indexical sign. A thermometer is an indexical sign. Causal relationships involved. And um, finally, the symbol is an abstract sign. And obviously, much of language is like that. There is no intrinsic relationship between whatever the sign looks like or is and the object or meaning that it represents. Um, he also drew many other distinctions within um, the types of objects and the types of interpretants, um, but I don't think we will we'll have time to go into that now. Um, Moving on from that, on the next slide, just a couple of other developments within semiotics as a whole that I think are interesting and useful 
to be aware of. Uh, Charles Morris was somebody who followed very much in the person's footsteps, and he was one of the people who first brought up the distinction which we're all obviously very familiar with now between syntactics, semantics, and pragmatics. So syntactics is the dimension of relationships between signs themselves. Uh, in obviously in linguistic terms, it's the sort of grammar of a language or a sign system. Semantics concerns the relationship between the sign and its meaning, uh, or its objects, its interpretants. And pragmatics is the use of the signs, the effects of signs, which actually goes on when you're using them. Um, this, interestingly, was also later used by Habermas in his theory of communicative action, and that's something we will come on to later, as that's part of the framework. Uh, another major figure was Roman Jacobson, um, and he took one of Saussure's other distinctions, that I haven't mentioned now and developed that a lot. Uh, one of Saussure's distinctions was that if we try to understand how something comes to have its meaning, so a sentence, then he said there were two dimensions that were involved. One dimension, the syntagmatic dimension, was the way the words or signs were placed relative to each other within the sentence. So which were the objects, which were the subjects, which were the verbs. And so part of it was how these different signs were related to each other within a particular sentence or message. And then there was the uh, paradigmatic axis, as he called it, which is not anything to do with paradigms, just a use of a similar word. Um, which was the way in which any one particular sign or word, for example, could be replaced by some other word. Uh, and so there's a different dimension in which different words, different signs, have similarities and differences to other things which could have been there instead. And so the meaning of the sentence or message as a whole comes from the combination of those two dimensions, syntagmatic and paradigmatic. Um, he also had uh, quite an interesting model of communication. Um, in which you had six different components, uh, which I've just highlighted there, and that's the basis of another paper that we're working on. Um, the addresser, the addressee, so the person who sends it, the person it's addressed to, the message, the context, the code, what needs it to have the particular signs that are being used, and the physical or psychological contact that needs the message to be sent. So I think that uh, Jacobson's model is quite useful. Um, on to the next slide. There's been a moderate amount of applications of semiotics within business and ICT. Uh, not a huge amount, and I think not as much as they should be. Um, the first one I've got there is to do with Ronald, uh, Stamper's Semiotic Framework, as is well known, um, which takes the one that I just mentioned with the three dimensions and adds some other part levels onto them. Uh, underneath the three, the material and the empirical, uh, and above the pragmatic, the social. And that forms the basis, that semiotic framework forms the basis of a lot of the work coming out within uh, the semiotics in information systems. But there's some other quite interesting approaches. There's um, been quite a lot of papers about semiotic analyses of ICT as a communication tool, for example, looking for two point more cover textuality in the web and so on. Um, there's also quite a lot of work in the area of human computer interaction, because obviously everything that you look at on a screen is semiotics. It's all signs in one way or another. And uh, there's a lot of work there about what, for example, D'Souza and O'Neill called semiotic engineering. How can we use the principles of semiotics to better make the design and computer interactions and interaction work? And in other areas of business, well, not in areas that So that's semiotics. That's the level of the fundamental sort of mechanics and basis of um, we then went up a level to say, okay, we've got something that we're communicating, we know something about signs and symbols that get communicated, but what is it that is being communicated? What is the content of the message? Uh, how do you know anything about that? And in particular, I'm interested or was interested in the difference, if there is one, between meaning, the meaning that a message has, and the information that it carries. Uh, if I say something to you, like there is a train at six o'clock going to Manchester, um, that has a meaning, we all understand its meaning. Does it also carry information? And if it does carry information, what's the information? Is the information different somehow from the meaning? What exactly is information? Um, so, uh, again, it's a big area, again, there's lots of different theories. The particular way that we're going here is that following particularly the work of Dretzky, who was a, an American philosopher, um, 
who developed a theory of semantic information and distinguished it from meaning. Information is the proposition of content of a sign or message, that which is implied by the existence of the sign or the message. So if some sign exists, what has led it to exist? What does it say about the nature of the world, about the way the world must be, in order for it to carry the information? Now, one of the um, controversial implications of that view is that for something to be information, it must be true. But being told something which turns out not to be true does not carry any information. Now, that is quite a contentious thing because lots of theories of information don't make that claim. They would say, it's still the information even if it's not true. Um, but that's the, and several other people, including myself, maintain actually that at the end of the day, if I tell you there's a train to Manchester at 10 o'clock and there isn't, then I haven't passed any information on to you. No information has been carried by that, even though it is meaningful. Even though you understand what it means, it might have been true, maybe I believed it was true, but, but in reality it wasn't. We can therefore call it misinformation, or even if I do it deliberately, disinformation. But according to this theory, anyway, the information isn't. Um, meaning itself in this theory has two sorts of uh, senses. Firstly, the system of meanings in a sort of social sense that exists out there for us to draw on and use when we're using our signs. Uh, and secondly, the particular meaning, the particular import, if I want to use a different word, that something has for you or me. When I hear, I'm told that there's a train at 10 o'clock to Manchester, do I thereby think, oh my God, I better get a move on, or oh, there's plenty of time I can go down the pub. Um, that is the meaning to me, and it's separate and different from the general meaning, the generic meaning that this particular sentence has. So the meaning for an individual is partly subjective, and eventually leads to some sort of inaction or action on their part. So that's the next level of the framework of building upwards to information. Now the next question is, okay, we've got some meaningful signs, we've got some information perhaps, um, how does that translate into actually understanding and doing anything in a human being. And there, um, I want to draw on uh, a lot of work uh, which goes under the area of in I'm sorry, um, embodied cognition. Now this is a viewpoint which is against the <coughs> dichotomy between mind and body. So the traditional Cartesian split between mind on the one hand and body on the other. Um, and mind does all the thinking and the body does all the do uh, is what this particular view goes against. It says that actually uh, cognition, thought, much of it is actually done by the body. It is done unconsciously by our nervous system, by our brain, the outer system is consciously being there. And so a lot of what goes under, you know, I'm not what we talk about thinking, is actually not thinking by some mental entity in the middle of our head, it is actually the body doing this stuff. Um, so it is the process by which information gets converted into meaning, and then that results in action. Uh, and again, here's some people who have followed this idea to some extent. Heidi von Miller, Ponti, Maturana, Gorta Maturana, Dervish, as we all mentioned before. In many ways, I think it's what Peirce himself called habits, because when he talked about how uh, signs came to be usable and workable, he talked about the idea of habit to human beings through a process of habituation. Um, this is a quote which tries to summarise briefly what the information is about uh, by Merleau Ponty, who is a French phenomenologist philosopher. Um, and he says, there is not thought and language as two different things. Expressive operations take place between thinking language and speaking thought. It is not because they are parallel that we speak. It is because we speak that they are parallel. I do not speak of my thoughts, I speak them, and what is between them. So that tries to express the idea that what is going on in our nervous systems when we speak is really an all of one. It is cognition that is involved in carrying out the body. Um, the next slide is a brief diagram which tries to show how we can start off with. <coughs> some sort of sentence in this case, some sort of message. Um, it's rather stormy, he says, as he looks out the window. 
Uh, and then the sort of levels of processing of that message done largely, as I say, unconsciously by the word. Well, first of all, we have to understand the sentence as it stands. What does it mean? It's rather stormy, but we speak English, etc. Um, then, that's the sort of level that anybody who is a speaker of English should understand. Then we move into what does that mean for me, this level of import, where we start processing in a way about what well, I was going to go out today, where I stay in now. What's the meaning for me? And then that leads us to have some intention, which may be to do nothing, or it may be to do something. And then that intention gets translated back into some action or speech in a similar way. We then generate some sort of uh, something by way of a meaningful sentence, and we end up saying, oh, well, let's not go to it. So that is the sort of level of processing that goes on. Um, then we move up on the next slide to the next level, um, the final level, you'll be glad to know, we don't go on all the way up, in which I then, I then try to bring in Habermas's theory of communicative action. Now, Habermas is a German sociologist who has a very well developed, very complex theory of pragmatic speech. So, it is at the level of what is it that we are doing when we are communicating with each other. And, uh, Habermas argues that when we are making statements, we're talking, we're saying things just as I am at the moment, then we are implicitly raising certain claims to validity. We're implicitly making assumptions which somebody could challenge. Somebody could say, well, no, I don't accept that. I don't believe that at all. Sorry, can you justify that? And that he's talking here about a process of understanding and a process of discourse, a process of rational discourse. And uh, he argues that, in principle, these validity claims are claims about three different notional worlds um, as a sort of analytical level. There is the material world, the world of objects and facts, uh, about matters of fact in the objective world that is the same for all of us. Then on the other hand, there are implicit claims about what he calls rightness, which is about social norms, about are we doing the right sort of thing, is this the right sort of uh, actions to be taken at this point in time, uh, and so on, so it's to do with the social world that we live in. So that's a world that we share with each other. So it's our world. And then finally, he says there is also, it raises claims about our own personal world, our individual world, and in particular about our sincerity in saying what we're saying. Do we really mean it? Are we being straightforward? Are we being honest? Are we being deceptive? Are we being strategic? Uh, what exactly does the message have in relation to our own personal values and experiences. Um, so he has these three different worlds that are going on and that we can raise uh, claims, entity claims, and discussions about. So when you put that together at the highest level, when you go on to the next slide, you get the basic framework in which uh, at the centre of it is this process <coughs> of semiosis. We'll, we'll make this the last slide. Uh, John, okay. And, uh, at the moment, in the middle of it is this process of semiosis, which relates to these three different worlds, the personal, the social, and the material. Um, and it relates to each of them in different ways, connotation and reproduction to the social, representation and transmission to the material, and the intent to the to the personal. And these three worlds obviously have their own relationships to each other. And that is where you get back to socio-materiality, really, um, in the critique that social materiality is, is pushing together two of them, the social material, so they become one, and is ignoring the third person. Uh, so it's, from this perspective, a very reductive sort of uh, philosophy. Yeah, I was aware of the time marching on, and, um, and uh, it's an extremely rich paper, and uh, I recommend you reading it if you want to get more out of it. There are lots of illustrative examples all the way through to bring out points. I think what we were trying to do with this paper is to build the model, which as you can see is a pretty hard task if you're going to build it from a, a social theory and a, a, a sort of philosophical foundations. And we were very happy with the file we got. The next paper we're writing is guidelines on how to apply the, uh, the semiotic uh, model, the integrative framework, to do actual research and we're in some way along the lines of, uh, of doing that paper, and uh, hopefully three months or so, we'd be sending that one in. Um, 
So that's as far as we got, and I'm aware that we have two other excellent uh, presenters, commentators here, so maybe we'll turn it over. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much. Unless there's uh, questions for immediate clarifications, then... Uh, Just one question. Uh, going back to the, to the idea of, uh, uh, you know, Habermas' uh, idea, you know, the three, three claims on validity. The first claim, to what extent is it different from the concept of information? Because you said truth. Yeah. As you said, sorry? It's looking for inconsistency. Yeah, it's no, 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 I'm not looking for inconsistency. I'm just trying, just trying to clarify. Yeah, no, they're very, yeah. I mean, they are clearly related. I mean, for Habermas, um, the material world is a world about which we can make statements which are either true or false. Um, and that's a different sort of thing from the social world where things may either be right or wrong. Um, but certainly, it, to me, it, it is entirely consistent with the idea of information being statements or being that which a, a sign or proposition carries, uh, which must be true to the information. Uh, to me, to say it's easy to know whether it's true or not, um, you know, we may not know whether something is true, we've seen that information, but at the end of the day, if it, if it isn't true, then it isn't information, we may then find that out. It's essentially mm -hmm. the same thing. Okay, um, so <coughs> we have Ronald to comment and expand. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, on the question, thank you. Uh, this was uh, extremely interesting to me, reading uh, um, paper by John and Leslie. I realized I inhabit a completely different world in many respects. <laughs> now, I hope this contrast will be, will be helpful to you and, and will spark some discussion. I'd better tell you a bit about my background. I, I worked in hospital administration and then the steel industry working on information systems in the days when computers that were much smaller than a, uh, a mobile phone occupied uh, an enormous building. Uh, but the problems uh, that we're dealing with now were, were visible. I, I was involved in, in creating courses and systems analysis for uh, the steel industry, and they became later the, the program of uh, uh, courses and systems analysis that the, the, the Ministry of Technology of Science and Technology set up for the United Kingdom. At that time, when I created those courses, I noted that all the other courses were run by computer manufacturers who uh, use them as a kind of sales tool, which you might expect, uh, uh, to, uh, to get the students on courses to make sure that their employers uh, introduced their, the computers they manufactured into their companies. But I, I took a different view. I wanted uh, the information systems to be developed to make the steel industry, the, the other companies that, that came on the courses, more effective, making use of technology where appropriate. And I, I looked at the way in which um, the, 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 tech, the, the computer applications were, were running. And it was clear that an enormous number of them failed, and usually because the, the people developing them, installing them, really didn't understand the immense richness and complexity of the human system. So something was seriously wrong. And if you have a trawl around the um, internet today, you'll find that, roughly speaking, 25% of projects succeed, 50% fail uh, on not having the right functionality, not being ready on time, uh, not meeting costs, and 25% are totally written off. So, from an engineering point of view, we're not being very successful yet. And back a long time ago, I thought, we'd better try and do something about this, try to bridge the gap between the technical and the social. Can we uh, have a way of understanding that unites those two very different domains, which tend to be populated by uh, engineers and scientists, or s uh, social scientists and others, who can often be quite antagonistic. Yeah. The, uh, creating the, the research program that I set up, um, I was funded by both sides, by the Science Research Council, EPSRC now, 
and the Social Science Research Council. And the, uh, the hard scientists said, because I, I started using legal norms as the experimental material in our work. And the, 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 uh, the hard scientists said, this, hmm, this isn't really science. It's got something to do with the law. It should be funded by the Social Science Research Council. So the Social Research Council started funding us, and they thought it was a very good idea until one of the people on that panel said, ah, but legal norms aren't just rules, you know. And I agreed with them. But nevertheless, we had difficulty with the funding. And the, 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 there's a really serious problem about the um, a dialogue that should be taking place between these, these intellectual camps. Now, one of the very interesting things that I say about reading uh, John Lenz's paper for me, this is a different world. I'm trying to inhabit this area in between. Your paper is, is, is very much more sensitive, I think, than most to the enormous richness, complexity, the subtlety of the, the social systems. Uh, it's very important. And the, the language they use, to me, seems exploratory. Now, if you look at it from the point of view of philosophical cultures, there are two broad philosophical cultures, the, the analytic and sometimes called continental. The, uh, the exploratory is on the continental side. The, the analytical wants to go down into detail, and that's what precisely you mean by X, Y, and Z. So the, the way I, I try to solve the problems that I've encountered in industry was to say, um, how can we start to look at the social system in a manner that allows us to be uh, sensitive to all the human aspects, yet at the same time um, precise and in a way that is satisfactory to engineers. And I regard myself from this point of view very much as an engineer. So, how do we do that? When I came to the LSE, just at that time, the Department of Health and Social Security, an immense government department, was computerizing. And it occurred to me that there's a, a shelf of legislation which actually defines what this enormous uh, organ of state should be doing. So, if we can express the norms there, at least a little bit of it, which is capable of being uh, handled by machinery, if we can express that in a precise way, although it is a set of norms for people, then we might be able to generate the any computer applications uh, more easily, more directly, and we'd be establishing a link between the two. So what I was trying to do was to, to handle ideas in the social domain using something that we can be fairly precise about. And uh, social norms, as uh, uh, represented by um, legal norms, legal norms or social norms have been very carefully thought out and written out very carefully. Um, they might give us a way of entry into, into uh, looking at the social side in, in some <coughs> precise detail. And this led to a lot of interesting directions. Um, I've been writing the book. Did, did any of you read the, the two um, chapters that were really introduction to that book, slightly modified? No? no? Yeah, I oh, <laughs> well, I hope you will. <laughs> well, um, yes, so it makes it more difficult for me to uh, explain this. Uh, well, uh, as uh, John mentioned, in addition to uh, the syntactics, seman uh, uh, semantics, and, and uh, pragmatics, it seemed to me very important to deal with the, 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 the material sign, the sign tokens, which of course Peirce was very clear about. The empirics, which comes from the work of, uh, of uh, um, um, the, the, the Tell me. <laughs> the the, 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 the uh, channel, channel, uh, 
from, from Bell Labs uh, um, looking at, at science, not individual science, but streams of science and the probabilistic characteristics of them. That is very important, especially at that time, people were saying, what do you mean by information? Oh, information is like the entropy uh, associated, measure associated with streams of science down at a communication channel. Well, that's part of it. But it seemed to me, if we were going to deal with uh, understanding <coughs> information systems in the social context, we, we need to deal with what it is that information delivers. Uh, it's okay to have the material signs, to have them arriving without too much noise, so that the complex structures that they represent can be decoded, and also that, that they have associated with them the necessary expressions of intention, which are going to, which people need to interpret. But then, then what happens? Nothing of value comes from the, uh, the information until something happens. The etymology of information, it puts form into something, just as the potter informs the clay when it spins on the wheel and he puts the shape in the wheel. Information informs the mind when, in some way or other, it puts some form into the, uh, the grey matter which is able to interpret it. So, the, the, um, the understanding of, of information is, is to be, in some sense, how we um, understand the process of um, acquiring form through the use of these sign tokens. Uh, and there are many different ways of doing this. So, adopting this analytic approach um, leaves me in a very different di direction. Um, John and uh, let's talk, talk of information and meaning. Um, almost suggesting that there is one thing called information and another thing called meaning. But the analytic approach, when we, we take these six different levels, we can find very different but quite precise operational methods for uh, identifying and measuring changes of the amount of form giving, the informing. Uh, on each level, you, you, you get a, a, a different but precise measure. Um, not time to go into that, but I, I happily um, write to you a, a, a document uh, explaining each of them. The, the book uh, information that appeared in Simple 3, um, after the, the two introductory chapters about organization and the semiotics, goes on to look at the different levels and uh, to have a look at, to, to a certain extent, how we can actually measure the amount of information, that is the, the giving of form, in different ways and the different levels. So there ain't no such thing as information. There are many different measurements of information, all of them operationally precise. And uh, it wasn't that I was inventing these were in the literature when I wrote that book a long time ago. So I, I'm very sad as a, a, a person with an analytical approach that, that those many different meanings of information are not simply widely accepted and differentiated because I, I, think, I think it will help us solve a lot of problems. And similarly with the terms like, like meaning and, and relevance there are also words which um, sort of capture a, a, a very important idea that is capable of being rendered very precise in an analytical way, but in different ways on each of those semiotic levels. And I think we need to use the different uh, uh, notions of meaning uh, in, in order to enrich 
our, our, our subject of, of semiotics. Now, uh, I, I know that the analytical view that I take uh, is, is often regarded as narrowing, you know, constraining people's uh, imaginative thoughts about the, the very rich uh, semiosis processes that take place in, in uh, uh, social situations. That is true, but I think despite that narrowing, that we can gradually build towards uh, solutions which are very acceptable uh, among colleagues who are more focused on, on the, the rich uh, social patterns. Um, the, the analytical approach actually brings us to a, a number of major points of agreement. Um, take one of them, the, the very close relationship between the material and the social. The work that we were doing on uh, in, information systems based upon the shared norms in the community forced us to look at questions of meaning in a very, very detailed, precise way. Now, when you look at questions of meaning, what what is meaning? It's in every case, there are lots of different ways of approaching it. They always in, involve a relationship between the sign and something that the sign stands for. You need to make some commitment about the class of things that science can stand for. And when you do that, you make a commitment of a deep philosophical kind. You're making an ontological commitment that these are the things that, from our point of view, exist in the world that we're going to be using science to talk about. Now, when you do that, you're really posing the question, what is real? What are the real things? What is existence? And adopting an, 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 an engineer's point of view, in this research we say, well, the things which a responsible, trusted agent can perceive, they are the things that exist. And then they have to be the things that the agent can take us to visit and check. Not some in our ma imaginations necessarily, but we have to start with the things we can visit. That's a very severe discipline. And it, it, it leads to a, 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 an understanding of uh, the nature of what exists, which is extremely limiting indeed, because it the only things that exist from that point of view exist here and now. The things that don't exist here and now, we know about because we have signs that stand for them. So this very narrow ontology <coughs> actually forces us to look at signs with a great deal of detail. And so we, we can begin uh, to, to examine the uh, the meanings on the, the levels of, of, of direct involvement, which presumably is the, uh, the material level, and then at the, at the personal level where people have experience of them, and the social level where we, we construct um, shared perceptual norms. And, and, and unless a group of people actually share the way they perceive the world, they won't be able to co collaborate, act in an organized way. Um, the, the analysis of meaning there brings one to the, the point that the material world uh, doesn't simply exist objectively, it has to be actively perceived. So adopting that approach forces one to a view that the, even the material world that we uh, inhabit um, um, Work, work within has to be socially constructed. So the very, very deep notion in, in, in what you're talking about, the uh, socio-materiality, I think is something which uh, this analytical approach uh, agrees with very clearly. And so al although we're, we're starting from 
for two different uh, uh, perspectives. There are many ways in, in which uh, uh, the, the, these two approaches uh, are, are very firmly in agreement. So I, I hope I've presented something of a contrast between our approaches, but also indications of, of how they, they do certainly fit together. So I'm going to shut up. Thank you very much. Yes. I really like to highlight is uh, uh, that they have brought uh, uh, three things, very important uh, three things together. Uh, so it's a social association, and then uh, embodiment, and then uh, the other one is the, uh, um, uh, so it's uh, the uh, uh, social materialism, uh, material uh, reality. So I think these two, three things are, are quite and they brought them together very successfully. So I think this is a kind of thing that they, uh, uh, I think I, I, I really enjoy the reading. Yeah, of course, the paper itself uh, is uh, well written, it's very logical, I mean, just like the presentation from John, it was very logical. Uh, very difficult subject, uh, very, because it's a sub, uh, complex in its own, and it's a very abstract, it's not uh, so closely related to our everyday life. Maybe it's related, but we never stop because we life, our life is so busy. We don't stop and thinking about this. Therefore, it's uh, not a, uh, that, uh, something that we uh, come across every day. So they brought these three words together, the personal, the social, and the material, and they acknowledge that they are independent, uh, but yet interrelated, uh, separate, uh, but they, 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 they act together. So they, I think this is a, uh, one of the things they mentioned. And then they uh, talk about uh, these uh, three uh, realism, uh, and then they brought them together uh, in a kind of a very uh, interesting, uh, coherent uh, picture. And then they, uh, I think something that I'm really uh, uh, excited about is they, they, they put the person in uh, into the uh, focus of the uh, discussion. They talk about the sign as a triadic uh, logic, and the sign itself is not a static artifact, it's a process. In the process, the, you were involved with uh, all the words together. Uh, so, uh, a representation that is um, a physical manifestation of the sign in its form. So, that was very clear discussion in there. And then, the, uh, there's an uh, uh, object, entity, uh, that's about the content and the substance. And then, uh, uh, also, we mustn't forget that the important thing is the effect or the idea generated in the uh, in an interpreter. So I think this is these kind of things are really uh, interesting. A lot of people sometimes forgot one or another. Uh, so the semiosis, hence uh, semiotics, is at the heart of representation and the transmission of the information and the meaning. So this is a very clear message, a very powerful message that makes people to really to think about it. Hence, a center to all our communication and to 
the subject that I, most of, most people are interested in, uh, in information systems. And uh, information systems, so far, still when people when uh, people are asked about what's the scientific foundation of information systems, people give a different answer. It's ah, computer science or physics or, or psychology. Or, but you, you, uh, you must uh, uh, realize that, that in fact, uh, semiotics has been there for ages, ages, but for a long time, uh, so years, and we really need to uh, look into those uh, into, to the uh, semiotic uh, subject, and you find a lot of things are explained there. It can be a very, or oh, it is a very good uh, foundation for our current uh, modern topic of uh, uh, study, uh, that is semiotic. Yeah. Uh, now I have a yeah uh, like Ronald and myself also have some questions. So one or two questions are quite limited, uh, related to uh, Ronald Stamper's uh, 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 question. Huh? So I think that, uh, from early John's paper and also in this paper, uh, a distinction is made between uh, the uh, information and the uh, and the meaning. Uh, I think in one uh, way. Uh, you follow that, uh, yeah, it, it's, it looks like it's a, uh, it's a, it's a kind of a logical deduction. Yeah, uh, yes. When you make a statement, when you have a, uh, a piece of a message, there must be something objective there which you can judge whether it's a, it's a, it's a true or false. Uh, it's a valid or invalid. You can judge that. Uh, but then, uh, in fact, I uh, uh, started to question myself. Um, is there really the notion of a truth? I think the truth, probably the notion of truth, uh, exists in a uh, platonic uh, uh, world. Uh, anything else? It's very difficult to say, is there really truth? If you say, yes, okay, this uh, surface is flat. Is it flat? To what degree is it flat? And then you draw a circle, you say, oh, yes, it's a circle, and uh, so the pi works, uh, a big ball and so on. But have you ever, never draw a circle? It's not possible in reality. So there is a okay. Truth it only exists in those kind of uh, those kind of uh, hypothetical situations. So that's why I started to question. Uh, yeah. But when you talk about uh, uh, a statement, you have a, a propositional content. That, that's a John's word, a propositional content. And that pro pro propositional content uh, would be the the information of that. Uh, I start to, to thought about that uh, because um, I think uh, it's very difficult to agree on a kind of okay, really, what is the, uh, uh, the truth? So uh, I think I have explained more or less my uh, question here. Uh, I would like to hear uh, John's uh, explanation later on. So uh, the really the the uh, the key point, the standing block, is uh, the notion of truth. Um, uh, like okay, is there objective or uh, objective uh, or true information? That's my question. Uh, same thing or different? The uh, meaning or, or meaning is subjective. I I have no problem with that. In fact, that's uh, I mean most of people agree. Uh, but the, the meaning and the info, uh, meaning and information. I'm not sure whether it's a uh, uh, same thing or different. Okay, and uh, is it reasonable to? Uh, uh, to assume there is a single and a greater reality and that it is out there, uh, basically it's there. Uh, so that's something that, okay, I know uh, most of pe some people would say, yes, it's there, whether you feel it or you don't feel it, but most of things when you come to talk about the, the relevance to our everyday life, we can't ignore that we as an agent, we have an angle, we have, we have to make a judgment. So the key notion is not really the truth or not, it's relevance. It's the responsibility, and then from there you can whether it's the truth or not, uh, relatively speaking, to that uh, uh, person. So um, I think that uh, a, what I've said here, a content language user has a rather ex uh, better access to, uh, to the shared knowledge, and therefore uh, for us we have a better shared knowledge, and therefore we, we, we all have a, almost a, kind of a uh, common understanding, culturally speaking, then we say, okay, we agree, and that's true. But true is still limited to, uh, to the degree of uh, what access do you have to that common, uh, commonly shared uh, language. In my uh, book earlier, I call it uh, pragmatic knowledge. Pragmatic knowledge is somebody can, people can share. Uh, 
if we have a better shared fragment knowledge, then we have a common view, and we think it's true. So that's a, uh, that's of my view. So hence, uh, norms are more likely to help us to derive the meaning uh, and uh, also information. So uh, here I, I I have a, uh, a difficulty to make distinction between uh, the two notions. Uh, so uh, I have some comments to make, and then uh, um, uh, these are the things I like to share with the colleagues here. Um, I think the uh, again I think there's a topic, and then uh, the paper itself is uh, highly relevant. It has uh, high relevance of the uh, to the work that we are doing. So and also um, it, uh, highly relevant to the organized activities from a semiotic point of view. Uh, we uh, use uh, uh, we use the theory to organize, to examine the organized activities. That it will become uh, more relevant to us because we are talking about organizations. We don't we are not so interested in like uh, okay random activities uh, that would become the subject of uh, other uh, other studies. But information systems, I think we uh, we we pay more attention to the organized activity. Hence we. Uh, have this uh, discipline of organizational semiotics because that's the, the, the area of the study uh, where we want to apply semiotic principles um, to address those problems. And then the uh, uh, next point I want to mention is that uh, I think it, it is a uh, uh, lot of people when we talk when they talk about information, they talk about information flow as if we can control the information to flow from here to there. And, but in fact, it's not uh, the case. It's very difficult to control information to flow from here to there. Uh, in fact, information is a, uh, like Ronald uh, made that, uh, in, uh, that term, information is a field. Information, in fact, it's like, a, uh, it's like a, a, the gravity, the yeah, field of gravity. You are, when you are in this, on this earth, you have to be controlled by this. You have to be affected by this, whether you, uh, you, you are willing or not. So it's a, like when we have information, the information will have an impact on the people who have access to it. So it's, a, it's a, not a flow, but it's a field. Uh, so that, I, I found that metaphor very useful. Uh, that's why we are talking about the pervasive nature of the sign of semiosis and semiotics, because it's, it's, it's pervasive. Uh, it's, uh, if you uh, have the uh, access to that information, then basically or the, uh, the you were be affected by that piece of information. Um, uh, uh, the key role of norms uh, is, a, is a very important. The, the norms, in fact, that probably it's more centered than they, or it's, a, it's very important uh, uh, when we talk about the truth or not, uh, valid, uh, valid or not. So in fact, there is no truth, truth, but there is also always a norm. Norm will be ground for us to talk about it whether that, uh, piece, uh, that message is uh, true or not in terms of information. And then another notion I want to uh, uh, reinforce is the affordance. And I think in this paper, uh, it talks about uh, continuous uh, growth through the interaction in the environment. I think this is really uh, the point that I, 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 can, I totally uh, appreciate. Uh, because uh, once we have each individual uh, a group or, or, or Cultural group, when they uh, when they interact with the, with the environment, then they acquire ability, and that ability will become part of that agent. And then later on, you wouldn't really uh, think that it's a kind of an indirect agent or uh, acquired agent. Uh, so therefore, it's very difficult. To, uh, you heard the, uh, John made a distinction between lexical sign, symbolic sign, and, uh, and, and uh, another sign, iconic sign. And then um, the iconic side is very intuitive, uh, but when people learn things in reality, and then although it's a symbolic uh, by uh, like a, a convention and so on, but you learn that it will become naturally become your uh, part of your direct uh, affordance. So in that way, you, uh, your affordance will grow naturally. So uh, in the first place, it was symbolic sign, and then you have to learn by convention, and then you have to. Uh, uh, remember that uh, uh, nowadays you don't uh, always use X for multiplication and use a star for multiplication because of the emergence of the keyboard. 
uh, then later I just take it for granted. So okay, that's not a symbolic, uh, symbolic sign in that sense anyway. It's part of my um, uh, 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 part of my affordance. So this is in fact uh, the way we learn things as an organization. We also learn in that way. They yeah, acquire affordances. The later affordance will be built on the early affordance. In that one is also reflected in some of the uh, writings of the or many of the writings of the So, uh, I already said that, uh, that responsibility as a notion was the truth. I think maybe responsibility is uh, more relevant uh, in the subject that we're talking about. Uh, and then, uh, in fact, the last thing I want to mention is uh, organizations in Yotics now, uh, you can see that I come from Reading, and we have a, a very uh, active research center in organized semiotics and we bring the organized semiotics to business informatics and then in fact that, uh, uh, what I want to mention is some of the points I uh, uh, <coughs> presented here are reflected in uh, one of in the uh, new book uh, with me and with my colleague uh, Vicky uh, to be published uh, this year so some of the things are in here uh, okay I think they are, uh, in conclusion I think the uh, uh, interactive semiotic framework, as it, uh, presented in John uh, Leslie's uh, paper, I think it's very useful to handle issues of people and the resource because we have to talk about the resource. Uh, now, why things happen uh, like this? There are through a lot of disruptive technologies. Technologies are the agent for change. So these kind of things cannot be ignored. And they put these things very well together. And then they put them into the organized context, into the organized activities. And then, in fact, the organized activities, organized context are information systems. If you look at it from that uh, semiotic point of view, they are information systems because the signs are used and then to achieve goals. Yeah. Uh, in fact, if I uh, uh, one of the uh, and one of the uh, uh, in one of the conferences uh, I organized recently in organized semiotics, uh, somebody from uh, business school, uh, the dean of the business school. In fact, in business school there are a lot of subjects of uh, uh, HR, marketing, and so on. Yeah. Uh, then uh, the dean of the business school said, that, in fact, uh, now uh, to be a good dean of a business school of so many subjects you need to know very well informatics because informatics, information management, that's center of all the subjects. Okay, whether he was trying to just to please me because I was <laughs> organizing uh, the uh, uh, organized semiotics and informatics conference or not, but he said that to the whole group and a lot of people seem to have accepted that idea. So I think, uh, in short, uh, I think this is a triangle that they have brought in this paper really have a, a made a, a very good contribution and it made us to think. So uh, that would be my comments. Thank you very much. Um, thanks to all the panelists. <laughs> Before I maybe open to the questions, I, I would like to ask the uh, Leslie and John if, if you want to um, immediately respond to the uh, questions. For a separate question to start, so my name is Florian, I'm with PhD here, and I wanted to ask John if you can make your argument a bit more clear. So I think it all sounded very interesting, but I didn't quite follow the jump from critical realism to semiotics, and also the point, what is exactly the benefit for us as researchers to use semiotics. So my personal background is, uh, my first degree was in literature, and I spent a lot of time reading about semiotics, actually, and for any theorist who was arguing for semiotics in literary theory, we had another one, like Susan Sontag was arguing against it. So I guess probably similar to what is the main argument for it. Um, I think the critical really, it's not so much a gut uh, There's not so much a jump from the human yeah, yeah, it's not so much a step from critical realism to semiotics. It is more about critical realism is the philosophy which 
think or we think underpins or is able to underpin all the rest of the stuff. So it's, it's the sort of basic underpinning which, which has that set of ideas within it, which enables us to avoid having to have these dichotomies between interpretivism and subjectivism, which enables us to deal with and accept a real world even if we can't um, naturally or easily have direct access to it and so on. So there are many things about realism which I personally find important. Um, and then it starts with semiotics as the sort of basic point. And that semiotics is something which is comfortable within critical realism because Basco himself talks about it at various times. Um, as for why semiotics, well, I don't know. I suppose I would say why, how can you avoid it? Um, once you come across the idea of representation, that the way in which we talk, the way in which we think as well, is not simply direct um, perception of the world, but is a representation of the form of the world, uh, and thereby has some sort of relationship to it, not necessarily a direct one, then one immediately gets put into the realm of well, where those representations come from, what they're made of, how do they come to be as they are, and it seems to me that one then immediately comes into the realm of semantics because that is what it is about. It's like saying, you know, can you do, can you look at physical without knowing anything about chemicals? Well, not really, because that's what physical works about. I think the other reason why we jumped on it was uh, because the way that advanced communication technologies are going, information communication technologies seem to render a more a more semiotic analysis of of uh, the meaning of things in, in the media, but also in terms of the signs we use in information communication technologies at work. And we have several examples in there. I mean, Giannis's uh, case study of the uh, dairy production plant is great for the richness with which it demonstrates uh, how people are moving to a much more abstract, impoverished world when it comes to signs and meaning, and what it is to work in that type of environment. And I think what we're trying to do is provide a tool for analysis so that people do not forget that actually these, these things are created. Again, we have a, a case study by Ulrich and Schultz about the virtual worlds, and this is the world that people inhabit very often, a completely created world. So. To have an analytical framework that allows you to actually accept the central role of semiosis in such a world enables you to do uh, uh, more research in that area. And we've just found that, you know, Ronald did some great work and you did some great work in this area, uh, and it seems to have been on the wayside somehow or other. And yet, yeah, it, it's never been needed more than now, as far as we can see. <laughs> So we try to create a, a way of that people can actually research the area. Yeah. I, I find your, your concept of embodiment fascinating because um, it supports very strongly, uh, especially in cognitive theory, things like dual process. You know, that the, the human has an automatic process. My, my uh, PhD was related to multimedia perception. A lot of the perception that we have and our understanding of the world we don't have a control of. Uh, and I, I think that's very interesting because it, it brings out the automatic and also system one, system two ideas that you can, you can choose what to focus on. And I think that's very, very interesting. It does raise some interesting things about how we learn and it, it brings up some really interesting questions about kind of the perception. So from my point of view, I think you've sold it to, to me and I can kind of see how I can build on this. Um, for, from the point of view of the social, norms as well. I mean, I know uh, Ronald Stone work originally from Paul with the sort of valuation framing of sort of learnt culture and learnt interpretation. I mean, do you see those things being sort of related in some ways? Can you learn th those things? Or, or uh, Yeah, I mean, we become associated into a world, or into many worlds, physical world that we deal with, and the social world and, and the linguistic world. World and all of these things are things that we become encultured into without really realising it. And we then live in a lot of the time without really realising it. And some things we can consciously reflect upon and sort of get out and think about the world and think about because of this and And other things we do almost, and it's almost difficult to get them out into consciousness. So I think in that respect, a lot of the stuff that Heidegger did on you know, um, you know, 
these are the validity checks for a successful communicative act. To me, it seems like your paper would have an implication on what are the characteristics of a successfully designed information system. And I don't know if you got that far, if you're thinking about it, or how does that help us understand how to design and implement good information systems? Well, I think it, I mean, it depends whether you're talking about the level of information or an information system. You mentioned Shannon. And there are debates about the truth of anything. Um, in many cases, you may not know whether something is true or not, but you may know whether it works or not. And if something is correct in some way, then it actually works. And if something isn't correct, it doesn't work. So, for example, I gave you my pin number, just to take a very trivial example. If I gave you the right pin number, then it would work, and you would get some money back. If I give you the wrong pin number, it won't work. Uh, so for me, giving you the correct number will be giving you some information, giving you the wrong number will be giving you not information. And that, in a sense, is a good example of how something working or not working can be measured whether something is information or not. Okay. And certainly, we now go to information systems, and they're called information systems because they're supposed to have information in them. And information, from this perspective, has to have the characteristics that it is quite true or correct or whatever in order to be a successfully working system. And so that's coming at it from the information point of view. And then the other point of view is the one that Leslie was just talking about, which is that we've got to recognise that information systems are forms of representation for us and they structure the way that we uh, interact with the world. And therefore they too are not just transparent things that don't have any effects on us, they actually structure the way that we're able to do and interact with so that leads me to say what's an effective one, what I'm saying is why semantics is important. I mean, just to add, you know, if you wanted a philosophical addendum to our, our model, it would be pragmatism, which answers the, the questions you're asking about validity claims. And, and, you know, does it work? Um, in what, what conditions does it work? It would be a, a pragmatist uh, uh, principle. Yeah, I mean, Habermas is sort of a fairly heavy theoretical sociologist, but his theory of community faction was originally called universal pragmatics. Um, that's what it's likely to be called as a reference to Chomsky's universal realm. Um, but it was about pragmatics, it was about the actual practical use of things uh, in a communicational sense, and how we actually communicate and understand each other. The, the other thing that John didn't mention, he mentioned in the paper, I think, was that Habermas himself was influenced by Peirce, which is why there's an elective affinity between critical realism uh, and uh, have a mass and, and uh, yeah. Perth. Lots of people have been affected by Perth actually. The more you read yes. them, the it's more amazing, yeah. you find that A, how much stuff is done, yes. and B, how much of it actually was never really picked up at the time, but is actually very modern. In what he was thinking 100 years ago, was stuff we're still kind of thinking about. Yeah. I suppose it came from a science engineering background as well, which is also interesting. Mm -hmm. But and just just recommend the, the those six uh, levels in, in the semiotic framework as a checklist. If an information system you're looking at fails to work on any one of those levels, then it needs uh, examining again and redesigning. So it, it, it helps one to take an extraordinarily complex problem, break it down into at least six components, which aren't each of them nearly as complicated as a lot. So check this. Thank you. Um, I haven't read the paper, but I very much um, enjoyed the presentations. And um, I'm in media and communication, so I'm not a specialist in information systems. <laughs> so for me, give my uh, question if it's sort of off base, but I'm thinking about your triangle, of the personal and the social and the material. Um, I just recently supervised a, a thesis which was very much uh, pressing Habermasian pragmatic study of medical information publishing information systems. Um, and the examiners came along and said, you have privileged the personal social dimension by focusing in the way that you have theoretically, obviously a much less rich theoretical framework than you presented, but nonetheless. Is, would you argue maybe that the, your framework tends to privilege that part of the triangle and in some way, uh, leave the material somewhat 
hanging from the end. Whereas the sociomateriality people have in a sense switched in the other direction and said we'd almost rather privilege the material in some way. And um, notwithstanding their conflation of the social and um, technological. And that you can't have everything in one framework, I'm thinking, when you do apply research. I think I guess that's what my question is. Can you conceive of applying this rich framework in a way that is even handed about all the relations of the triangle? Yeah, I mean maybe in the paper, because it's a bit about semiosis rather than so much about the material side of things. But um, I mean to me the embodiment is is the material it's about the relationship between thought and body between these materials. It's not machines and technology, um, but it's physical. And so within the framework, to some extent, that is that picking up on that connection. But I mean, I agree with you say that within what we've talked about, we've talked less about computers and hardware and stuff like that. Well, I think also, we, if we do stress it, you haven't read the paper, but we don't think we do, but if we do, unconsciously, it's a reaction against the stress on the technology that has appeared in previous literatures that we were trying to critique. Right. <laughs> uh, question for everyone. Um, in the panel. Uh, to me, this process of uh, what doesn't work is a process of job we call digitalization. Basically trying to reduce uh, the world which fed complex in two states, violent states. My question really is, not me, but sense making. What does sense make mean and sit in this process of digitalization? Is it just meaning or there is something else or something, something else to um, Well, from my point of view, really it's following Drex's analogy. Um, what we receive by way of sight, as I look around this room, is animal. It's full of rich pictures, colours, all sorts of different things that all the different senses can uh, receive all the time. And we cannot take all of that in. We have to do some form of truncation of that, and that's what Gretzky calls digitalization of the animal. So that is what we actually do, subconsciously conjuring up, creating, or capturing from this richness a particular concept or idea that it's too hot or that person's not listening to what I'm saying, whatever it is that we do at any particular point in time is constructing that digitalization of the and that is, as you say, a process of sense making, it's a process by which we conjure up something out of the vast richness of what there is, which is the bit that we're at that second focusing on it and change and change what it's what we're doing all the time. So what just let me follow up if I'm allowed. So then what's the difference with information? Are the two things... Well, if... I mean, that's... Well, case. well... Information, I mean, that is our process of, of digitalizing the animal, generating some sort of internal mental picture from what, what is there. If it turns out that that mental picture that we generate um, can also be said to, as it turns out, um, have some representation of truth or correctness to the world, then we can be said to have got some information from it. If it doesn't, if we conjure up some image which actually, or a sense, which actually doesn't relate to anything that is true or correct about the world, then we conjure up something, we've got some meaning, but what it is isn't also information. So for me, information is meaning or sense, that also happens to be correct or true. something about it, you do something about it, you get a different conclusion from mine. 
Okay, so I don't know whether we are doing like day, uh, meaning mining or sense mining. I don't know about that. Yeah, uh, but I know for sure it's a kind of abductive reasoning. So sense making is an abductive process. Uh, abductive process is one of the key notions in uh, semiotics. And uh, uh, amongst the three reasonings, uh, deduction, abduction, and uh, uh, induction, the abduction is the only reasoning that will bring us a new knowledge. That the only mass, uh, uh, reason that were generate a new knowledge. Uh, you generate, you, so what do you do is with big data, you have some hypothesis, it's in your mind. That what, what, how, how did you get the hypothesis? You have your prior knowledge. Is that, what's the prior knowledge? Uh, knowledge is a norm. So you have, a, because you have experienced a lot of things, you have some, some norm. Therefore, you make some hypothesis. And the hypothesis should be something plausible. You don't make a, a ridiculous hypothesis. You saw the, the loan is wet. I say either it's a, uh, a watered by your wife. That uh, didn't mean your your wife uh, last night, or it was raining last night. So you don't make other ridiculous uh, 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 hypotheses. And then you were use uh, induction and abduction. I mean, I have some kind of details about this. Yeah, uh, induction is you you uh, you talk about. Um, uh, you use a deduction for a kind of a, a valid, uh, induction you use uh, as an empirical uh, method you use for uh, validation therefore you can uh, generalize, uh, generalize it and then you use a deduction for a kind of a, uh, application and just try to see whether it will uh, conform to your original hypothesis so you have to use this kind of three reasoning uh, 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 so that's how you make sense, and then the sense that you have made might be subjective. So I don't know whether in the end you would do something that would be entirely objective. So that's something that I have a question. I'm, I'm not totally to say that, okay, uh, this table is a table, and I, you, I disagree with this table. Not to that level, but I think that somehow after that kind of, a, um, that kind of a very fundamental level, then the debate will start. The objectives will keep in very uh, explicit. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I, I, there's a, a distinction that we found very important between the the informal part of the system, where a whole richness of uh, Human sensitivity, imagination, ability to perceive all kinds of signals, uh, and enables us to to collaborate in, in rich ways. And where where the system is is formalized, where things are, are set out in say written rules, and another part where the system is is mechanized so that the the formal part can then be handled by the machinery. And, and in the digitization, in a way, is uh, achieving some kind of migration from the, the rich informality into the formal to the, the mechanized. Um, and one needs to be very careful where you, you place functions across these, uh, these, these boundaries. If you have ways of approaching the development of information systems which leads you towards more and more formality and to getting things on the computer, which is in some quarters the, the, the great uh, uh, aim of life. If, if, if you do that, you, you, you often create a system which is unnecessarily expensive and, and also uh, rather rigid and incapable of adaptation because that, the, the rich capabilities of adaptation and sensitivity are in the informal system. And in, in the, the little things I'm prepared to, I'll try to give some illustrations of that kind. So the digitization is, is associated with this migration from the formal to the formal and to the, uh, to the, to the mechanized. And you have to be careful. I, when I was in the army, I was, I was struck by uh, the, the problems of um, being very formal about the rules. Uh, there was in the, the squad that I was in when 
first recruited a man, his name was Sparks, which I thought was a lovely name for him in the circumstances. And uh, he, uh, the first time that the sergeant came in and said, right, tomorrow, tonight, you've got to blanco all your kit. I don't know, blanco is a kind of clay that you put on um, um, sort of webbing things that you belts and dungeons, all kind of stuff like that, and, and you polish your buttons and um, sparks said, sort of, do we have to blank out all our kit? Yes, all your kit. So, yes, Sergeant. So in the morning, Sergeant came, and he blanked out not only his webbing, but his uniform and his boots, his sheets, the whole lot. Very good Sergeant, you know, done a good job, don't you think, Sergeant? Sergeant was driven mad by this, this weird man who, who took this very clear statement of what he had to do, utterly, utterly, literally. And the sergeant tried to deal with this, but Sparks was able to take his formalized rules and obey them exactly and cause chaos, really. And after, after about three weeks, he was discharged from the army. They couldn't go with this man who was, well, rather skillfully ignoring all the informal sides and doing everything in this strictly formal way. And that taught me a lot of lessons about uh, different kinds of uh, fractions of the information system. That was really, truly informative, that, Mr. Sparks. I think all the stuff that um, James just talking about, abduction, etc., is very, I very much agree with that. It's all very much the heart of critical realism as well, which you can mm -hmm. Critical realism talks about retroduction, and it's very much something about a lot of critical realism. Um, you know, it's really, really similar to both. Perhaps I should say things. Abduction is very much concerned with translating things from the informal into the formal part of the system. Yeah, um, you're pretty sensitive to the fact that. Framework, the semantic framework, as in contrast to the social matter reality approach. And uh, one of the aspects that I realize that there is also different with, and that I think you didn't um, discuss, is the aspect that uh, you are assuming a, a represent, representationalist approach, as in this idea that science represents the world, and uh, social material approaches and close approaches would depend the idea of performativity, which also link with the previous authors that, in a sense, would be considered as uh, semioticians or philosophers of language, such as Austin, who wrote the book of how to do things with words, this idea that words do have an effect in the world, yeah? Above all in certain contexts, and therefore, yeah, it's this assumption of, it's a certain perspective on pragmatism at the end, yeah, looking at the context of communication. Uh, so uh, kind of my first question was if you have considered this idea of performativity within the, co within the con uh, context of pragmatism perhaps. And related to this, I think there is a linked issue. I also have a problem that uh, you have uh, raised, this idea of linking information with truth. And I guess I have a concern with that because uh, in a sense it seems that one can assume value-free or neutral representation. And it's in that sense, perhaps, that uh, a more social material approach would say, aren't we performing, or at least, aren't we always, um, well, can we be value-free? Yeah, I, I, I see where you're coming from. I don't want to, you're talking about the importance of representation. I wouldn't want to be seen as being a representationalist. That's what I think so. uh, well, um, yeah, as opposed to a sort of performative environment, mm -hmm. because as I've said, I think a lot of it is about embodiment and action and performativity. It's just that I do think that representation is something which is there, which affects the way that we enact the world. So it's not one against the other, it's both together. Um, so I do, do accept the performativity uh, point of view. Mm -hmm. But I do think, you see, with comes back to critical realism in a way for me, that 
there is this distinction between the transitive and the intransitive. Mm -hmm. and no matter how much um, we recognize the fact that we as human beings are continuously creating and evolving what we do, at the same time, things get outside us. So even speech, even what I'm saying now, can become transitive once I say it. And it can then become an object of knowledge. You can ask, well, did he say it? Did he say that? Is that right to say that? Mm -hmm. It becomes something which you can investigate and which you can have as an object of your knowledge. So I do want to maintain at the end of the day that there is this separation and there's this external domain to us all the time that we are continually creating. But somehow it disappears when it says something to and then in this way to defend the idea of truth. Yeah, but ultimately we may never be able to know truth, we may never be able to find and recognise and totally prove truth, and critical realism accepts that it is ultimately um, fallible. You know, whatever knowledge is always fallible, it's always relative, it's always the best that we can do at the moment. So you may never know if something is actually true in their direction of creation, but actually that doesn't matter. Um, at the end of the day, if it is true, it is true, it is true. on this, uh, because I wanted to ask exactly, more or less, uh, close to this. Um, I also uh, I was struggling a little bit, why do we need, why is it necessary for, to maintain, for the rest of the framework to actually work, to maintain that the information needs to be objective or true? Because, uh, because I appreciate the rest of the framework, and, and, but I, think, I also think that, I think that information is strong, it pertains to, be, it belongs to the transitive domain. And, uh, and in that sense, uh, um, because it is sufficient for uh, information, if we take it, it as an event, to, uh, for a system or for a person to take this uh, uh, proposition, if it is a propositional statement, and act upon it. And, and so it is sufficient to trigger a chain of reactions. And it, it doesn't necessarily then so information is a, is a subjective event that is related to an objective reality of a statement that doesn't need to be itself related to an objective state of things. Because I think the problem with, uh, with saying that uh, information needs to be true is that then we, ne we are never really able to quantify or to, or to specify if a piece of statement is actually true because we need to regress ad infinitum to specify is this well, this uh, actually requires for this to be true. Is it true? Yes. It, this requires this to be true. And, and so we need to really to maintain the truth of all of our beliefs in order to actually maintain that any statement is actually true. Oh, Which um, I think yeah. is quite unpractical because then we, the, the amount, we, then, then information systems become belief systems as a discipline because the amount of misinformation that they handle and contain is more the amount of information. Well, I think that's probably right. I think most yeah. information systems do contain a huge amount of misinformation. Um, I think it was Russ Ackov about 50 years ago who wrote a paper called Management Misinformation Systems. Uh, and he was quite right because most information is, most of the data that is in systems that we call information systems is probably false. And therefore, shouldn't we be called information? Um, but, you know, if you start out from very simple things, if you're driving in your car and you look at the petrol tank, so it's your heart rate. That appears to be carrying information about how much petrol you've got in the tank. And you drive along and you think, great, but then suddenly your car is like, oh my god, I've run out of petrol. And it's because the gauge was stuck. So the gauge was not actually related to the petrol you've got in the, in the tank, and it was therefore not carrying information about the amount of petrol in the tank. If it was working properly, then it would have been carrying information about the tank. And it comes down at the end of the day to a pragmatic reality is that you either end up stuck in the motorway or you end up getting home in the road. And I agree that you can't ultimately prove any particular thing to be 100% true, but then I think the philosophy of science has to go that way anyway. We can't prove anything to be 100% true, so we have to accept that it's clear, pragmatic quality. Is it, is it working? Is it well, sufficient to be working? We just said, uh, uh, no, it's just that I'm aware of the time, that's all, yeah. sorry. It's a matter of definitions, I think. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
I think some of the issues you discuss, and the issue that uh, Rosser raised, John, is if you adopt a veridical view of information, veridical meaning true or not, then you make, I think you constrain the range into which information statements, or statements of information uh, apply. Because I think what you do implicitly is the claim that information is only about denotation, only about declarative statements or denotative statements, which can be assessed in terms of truth. The door is open. Is it open or closed? I can may assess it in terms of truth or not truth. But there are other aspects of life which are not necessarily assessed in terms of truth, but in terms of correctness, in terms of rightness, righteousness, or in terms of aesthetics. Therefore, there are more games in which information is an intrinsic part, and which, in the end, cannot be really reduced to the veridical view, but we need other criteria as well, correctness, pragmatism, as it were, as it were, it's not about you, I think. Uh, but also aesthetic values. Is it beautiful? That is from, uh, uh, so that is my, my what the issue I would raise. We restrict a little bit the... Yeah, I mean, firstly, I, I agree to some extent because in bringing in Habermas, I am, I am thereby broadening the notion of what I might include as information to include such things as rightness and sincerity, as well as simple truth about what is a fact. That's point number one. And point number two, I think, yes, it may be better to talk about correctness rather than truth. Um, I mean, I use truth because that's what Drexler was talking about, and that's where it comes from originally, and that's what it's made in literature. I, I, so I, I think you need to be true. So I think correctness. Whether you want to get as far as saying aesthetic judgments are about information or information is about aesthetic judgments, I'm not sure what you want to say about information. I think that uh, in some instances you may say things about aesthetic objects, for instance, and you can express a view about whether a painting or a poetry is. Uh, beautiful, it makes sense, is one thing or the other. Those things you articulate as aesthetic statements are not really accessible in terms of truth. No, they have a relevance. Are they there for information? Uh, I don't know. Would you want to call them something else? Other than I, I, would, I would say that these are something... Don't misunderstand me. I think truth is important. And I would agree with you that truth applies to a significant number of statements that are being mediated through information advice. I would agree. But other things, like performances, uh, righteousness, correctness, and aesthetic values may not exactly yeah. conform to this. I agree. This. So, for example, if one talks about um, performative knowledge, like saying I can ride a bike, we can test that by whether somebody actually can ride a bike or not. Yes. Give them a bike and they test it and they can either ride a bike or they can't ride a bike. So there are forms of knowledge which are performative purely and simply. Can I play a piano? Can I speak French? All sorts of things like that. Which are not the same sorts of types of knowledge or type of as knowledge of facts. If you know. So the information might come if you say, I can ride a bike, then that is an informative state if it is in fact the case that you can ride a bike. How you test that is by getting them to ride a bike and seeing whether they can do it. So it's a different way of testing the result. Mm -hmm. but, but nevertheless, if you say, I can ride a bike and you can't ride a bike, then that's not giving you any information. It's not being informative. Except that perhaps it ultimately tells you that you're lying to them. If you find out that you actually can't. And thereby one would then ask, well, what reason are you saying that? And therefore, one might come up with information about what's going on in your head, which would lead you to being sincere in that way. So I think it is a complex thing. I, I agree with you that there are many more dimensions and aspects to it than simply.
truth or falsity in factual statements? We have time just for it. one uh, short question, and I think she was uh, waiting for too uh, uh, long. writing that paper. <laughs> <laughs> Wait till the next instalment. <laughs> no, but I mean, the point of the paper really is, is to emphasise, I think, the semiotics of it. It's a framework, I mean, the right, the uh, material, social and personal is a framework that's been around for years, because I've been most generally to people's kinds of theory, so I think the extra bit in this paper is the semiotic bit, and so what we're working on next is looking at uh, more kind of a methods paper, if you like, of doing the semiotic research. So that will be the answer to everything, but it will yeah. hopefully move things on a little bit in terms of different useful ways of doing stuff about semantics, which adds, I think, interesting ways of looking at the world to what we normally do. Um, I think the other thing to say is that what the triangle, the, the triangle does is it, it, asks, it makes you ask questions you would not otherwise ask in, in the first place, which are excluded by uh, the other perspectives that are important to bear upon information systems and the things you're describing. Uh, that's what we found when we looked at illustrative examples, wasn't it? You said, well, why haven't they asked that question? Why haven't they asked that question? Because they excluded semiotics and the first one from all consideration, even though it would have been quite interesting. Well, time is uh, it's over, and so uh, we would like to thank again the panelists. <laughs> Nico mentioned at the beginning this was the last ISF of the year, but he didn't mention it was the last one organized by him because he's moving to the University of Exeter. So the rest of the ISF team, which is Silvia and myself, decided we can't let him go just like that without mentioning his achievements in the team because he was critically involved in reinventing ISF two years ago. I never seen one of the old ones, but I heard they were quite boring. And Nico came up with the... As opposed time. to this one. <laughs> the whole panel system was set here, but he, he did organize a string of brilliant panels over the last few years, for which this is a great example. So I just want to take a minute to say thank you, Nico, for this.